Okay, uh, is the microphone working? Hey, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, and I'm really uh, thrilled to be here and I've had a great day visiting, meeting with all the, the faculty and, and students here. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, I, should, I should say that as, in addition to this being the uh, first colloquium of your semester here, this is actually the first colloquium speech talk I've ever given. So uh, that's going to be, uh, that, that's, uh, that's quite an experience. Uh, so honored to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, the latest in our knowledge of fast radio bursts, which are a relatively new astrophysical mystery whose study has become more, much more possible thanks to some recent advances in radio astronomy. In particular, I'm going to talk about the CHIME FRB experiments uh, and the problem of identifying host galaxies for FRBs and how the CHIME FRB outriggers program is going to push the field forward in both detecting and localizing FRBs. So to start, I'll give a, a broad survey of what FRBs are, uh, what we know about them, and how they can be useful for cosmology and galaxy formation science. So fast radio bursts, uh, it's all in the name. They are micro to millisecond duration pulses of highly dispersed radio emission, where dispersion refers to the phenomenon where uh, lower frequency components will arrive uh, later than higher frequency components. So on this, uh, uh, it's called the dynamic spectrum or waterfall plot. Uh, the frequency axis is on Y and time is on the X axis. And we see this distinctive sweep due to the, uh, the lower frequencies arriving later. Uh, this is due to the fact that there's a, a the speed of light varies in a plasma according to the frequency. So because uh, the, the universe is full of ionized gas, uh, it causes uh, this dispersion that depends on the distance to the, uh, to the source. So the amount of dispersion is proportional to the, the column density of free ions along the path of light travels. Uh, it's called the dispersion measure, and it's usually expressed in units of parsecs per cubic centimeter, uh, which comes out to inverse area. Uh, so it's kind of required for every FRB talk to show this same figure. This is the first uh, FRB that was ever discovered called the Lorimer burst. It was uh, discovered in archive data from the Parkes telescope in Australia back in, in 2007, although the, the burst itself was in 2001. And this, uh, for a sense of scale, has a dispersion of 375 parsecs per, per cubic centimeter. And I should also say right now that uh, for all of the uh, waterfall plots I'm going to show throughout this talk, they're all, they've all been de-dispersed, where the dispersion has been undone and the uh, pulse has been lined up again. So this is the only dispersed pulse you'll see. Uh, right, so the uh, history of FRB discovery uh, is really well captured, I think, in this figure showing the cumulative number of FRBs that have been, discover that have been discovered over time. Uh, so this plot is showing the uh, uh, time of the, of the FRB detection. So we see the uh, first, uh, the Lorimer discovery back in 2007, going to a burst in 2001. Uh, another one was detected a few years later. And then suddenly there's this huge leap when the CHIME FRB experiment started uh, observing the sky. And that's, this is when we started having experiments that could uh, look for FRBs in real time. Uh, so uh, just to really put this forward, like CHIME published a, a catalog of 536 new sources last year, uh, but we're seeing on average around 1,000 candidates every year, so about two to three a day. Uh, So what truly sets FRBs apart from other radio transients is the really high dispersion that we see in them compared with uh, most galactic pulsars, which we also see are dispersed. So this plot shows uh, on the x-axis its uh, galactic latitude, so the height above or below the, uh, the galactic plane. And in the galactic plane, there's a lot of material, uh, a lot of plasma, so we expect to see a lot of dispersion. So uh, pulsars, of course, are, are tend to be associated with the galactic disk. And, uh, but all these blue dots are FRBs from the, the CHIME catalog that all go to much higher dispersion, dispersions and uh, are all over uh, in terms of galactic latitude. So uh, from this, we can conclude that it's pretty clear that they're coming from uh, other galaxies. And it's, since the, dis the distribution is mostly isotropic, it's uh, most likely a cosmological origin. 
Uh, and from that, we look at how bright they are here. We know they're extragalactic, so we can infer that the FREs must be very, very bright to be visible from the Earth. Uh, for FREs that have been localized to host galaxies, we can actually measure the, the distance uh, precisely and calculate the intrinsic luminosity. And so that's uh, represented on this figure from a Nemo et al. paper where they took three uh, FRBs that have been localized and compared the burst energetics to several other uh, transients. So we see that they're generally a lot uh, brighter given their duration than similar uh, astrophysical phenomena. Uh, the brightness here implies that there must be some kind of non-thermal uh, emission mechanism uh, that's, that causes the uh, light to be emitted in phase with its, itself. So that gives some clue as to what could be causing these. So as I mentioned before, what uh, really sets these bursts apart, FRBs apart is the enormous dispersion measure. And uh, we can break down the total dispersion into three main components. Uh, so there's a, a contribution from the Milky Way. So there's uh, some contribution from the interstellar medium, which is uh, uh, well constrained, so fairly well constrained by observations of pulsars. And it's around the scale of 40 parsecs per cubic centimeter. Uh, and then there's a, a less well constrained com com uh, contribution from the galactic halo. Uh, in addition to this, you know, at the other end of the path, then from the, the host galaxy, there's going to be some contribution from the immediate environments of the FRB source, as well as the uh, ISM galactic halo, and possibly an intracluster medium if it's in a galaxy cluster uh, of, uh, of the source. Uh, but between the two, all of the uh, ionized gas in the intergalactic medium uh, contributes in a way that, at least for low redshifts or for low or nearby uh, sources, uh, scales roughly linearly with distance. So there's this, um, so this formula is called the Makar relation, um, and it's, uh, it gives you an approximate uh, dispersion measure based on the on the redshift and the uh, FIGM, which is the fraction of uh, baryons that are found in the, the intergalactic medium. And I apologize for throwing this. Uh, formula up here, but I've just included it to, to point out some of the important features. Uh, so this gives an uh, more details of the estimates for the uh, uh, mean of the DM contribution from the intergalactic medium. And you can see that uh, it depends on several cosmological parameters. So these are the uh, baryon fraction, uh, mass fraction, uh, matter mass fraction, and uh, dark energy, or uh, uh, mass or, uh, cosmological constant as well as the, the Hubble constant. And then there are some astrophysical parameters, such as the evolving uh, fraction of baryons that are in the IGM rather than collapse into galaxies, and the, uh, the fraction of, or the number of electron, free electrons that exist per uh, baryon. So in, in this one quantity, we have uh, probes of uh, cosmology, the feedback history of galaxy formation, as well as the ionization history of the universe. And on this plot I've shown, here's the, this total DM versus uh, a range of, of redshifts. And the uh, ionization fraction is shown in the orange line here, where at around a redshift of three, uh, we see uh, that's when uh, the universe is fully ionized, including hydrogen and helium. Uh, after that, so that, that stays roughly constant after that. And at lower redshifts, uh, galaxy formation is, t is taking off. There are more matter is being accreted in, or collapsed into galaxies. So the uh, fraction in the IGM is dropping off as well. And these are in very separate regimes. So we can actually, uh, with low, DM, or low redshift uh, FRBs, probe the IGM fraction, or FIGM. And with higher uh, redshift FRBs, potentially probe the uh, uh, epoch of hel helium reionization, although that's a little more uh, far-fetched to the future. Uh, in addition to the mean dispersion measure, the uh, distribution of dispersion measures that we see uh, can actually say something, something more about galactic feedback. So if we have galaxies with a lot of star formation, we'll have uh, lots of supernovae, which inject energy into the intergalactic medium. As well, you have uh, active galactic nuclei, which will throw uh, momentum into the intergalactic medium. And this feedback then uh, slows the process of cooling, which uh, allows the IGM gas to collapse into galaxies, and then affects how uh, these galaxy halos 
uh, are how compact they are. So if we look at a population, uh, a bunch of, of FRBs, we measure the uh, IgM dispersion measures, and we see uh, a distribution that's sort of skewed to one side, and that can imply that there's something, um, that these ga uh, halos are a little more compact than if we see uh, a more, uh, uh, a less skewed, uh, more evenly distributed uh, distribution. Uh, so that's the potential usefulness of cosmic DMs for understanding the intergalactic medium. But how does the analysis look right now? So this figure shows the uh, uh, dispersion measure versus redshift for the handful of FRBs that have actually been identified to a host galaxy, and um, along with uh, some galactic <coughs> sources. So the y-axis here is showing the, uh, the host redshift, and the x-axis is showing the dispersion measure. And we see uh, this line here is that Makar relation I mentioned, so a roughly linear relationship. And then the, the width here is an estimate of that uh, variance in dispersion measure. And for the most part, uh, certainly at higher, uh, higher DMs, they're mostly consistent with it. But lower DM, we see a lot of uh, that sort of exceed it. And by now, you've certainly noticed there's one that's way over uh, what we'd expect for, for, that, uh, for its redshift. So this really suggests that there's uh, a lot, or our knowledge of the, the host contributions to these bursts, uh, especially because the, the host contribution is more significant at low redshift, uh, is not that well constrained and can be, uh, can be a, a problem. And uh, to really drive this point home, uh, this plot shows uh, an estimate of the, the probability, like the distribution of DMs you would expect to see based on known properties of FRBs uh, and the properties of a, a particular uh, surveying instrument. And so uh, this is a uh, flip from the previous slide. This is the uh, redshift and DM. And there's the Makar relation. But we're more likely to see bursts that are uh, uh, at a, uh, for, for a, a high redshift, we're more likely to see bursts that are, um, oh, sorry, for, yeah, for, for a, a higher DM, we're more likely to see bursts that are at low uh, redshift that um, have a, a large host contribution than for uh, than at higher. Uh, all right, so uh, this last thing to say about uh, cosmology, but this is that this this is just showing uh, constraints made on uh, these cosmoparameters using a sample of five localized FRBs. Uh, this is from back in 2020, so it doesn't include all the, the data from the, the previous couple slides. Um, but it does try to jointly constrain for properties of the distribution of host contributions, uh, the uh, cosmological parameters, and a, a feedback parameter related to the, the width of the dispersion. We see we do get a, a decent constraint on this uh, uh, omega b uh, h0, but the other parameters are not very well constrained. So Takeaway here is that we really need more FRBs with associated redshifts in order to uh, make these constraints. Uh, so in addition to just being useful tools for cosmology, FRBs are just interesting objects on their own. And there are dozens of mechanisms that can produce uh, bright, short duration radio emission and a lot, lots of configurations of, of astrophysical systems that can make those mechanisms happen. And for a, while, for a little while, there were actually more theories of what FRBs were than there were actual observed FRBs. Uh, we're not quite in that, we're well past that, but uh, more recently, the popular emission models tend to focus, or tend to fall into two camps. There are shock models, where you have some central engine that's uh, putting out lots of, of uh, material that rams into the surrounding medium at relativistic speeds and uh, produces uh, emission from, from the shock fronts. And then you have uh, magnetosphere models where a, a magnetar or some other uh, compact neutron star with a strong magnetic field uh, has some, some kind of magnetic reconnection events or, uh, or charge acceleration in its uh, magnetosphere, and that produces the pulse. Uh, but a, a key observation to all this is the, the observation that some FRBs are known to repeat. 
Uh, for many years, only one of these repeaters was observed, but since then, several more have been identified. Uh, the repetition of FRBs means that we can't, uh, you can, we can rule out that cataclysmic events like a supernova or a binary neutron star merger could be responsible for all of them. At least the repeating ones, the, the thing that created it needs to survive the, the events. Uh, of course, we can't rule out the possibility that all FRBs repeat. So we, we don't know actually if the ones that we just see once are actually happening multiple times and we just haven't been lucky to see them again. Uh, in addition to, so the repetition so far has not been seen, shown to be uh, periodic in any way that you would expect, like a, a pulsar pulses every few milliseconds or every few seconds or so, uh, and, and it has a very regular pulsation period. But FRBs, it's a stochastic process. They're happening uh, pretty much at random, although, Two so far have been observed to have a, a periodic window of activity where every 160 days or every uh, 16 days we'll see a, an increase in activity and then a decrease, and that's been pretty regular. So this could be a very important clue to what's causing them. Uh, and a, a, my favorite example, or my favorite burst for a number of reasons, is this uh, FRB 2020-1124A which was discovered in November of uh, 2020 on the, the 24th. Uh, so that's where the, the names come from. And uh, we hadn't, the, well, so Chime had been looking at the site for years, didn't see anything, then suddenly started getting a bunch of events from it. And then the, a few months later, we started getting another event every day. And this is within a four minute window. So uh, after that, a bunch of other experiments started looking at it. And then the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope, or FAST, in China, started monitoring the spot and picked up 1,863 bursts in a matter of a couple months, which is the most any repeater has ever been observed. And from that, they produced, uh, well, among many other things, this plot of the uh, distribution of times between the bursts, which showed this bimodality. You have some bursts happening just milliseconds apart, and some bursts happening minutes apart. And they saw that this, the activity was varying on a, a, a large time scale, uh, or it became really active and then it kind of tapered off. And so, so far no periodicity has been observed, but now everyone's kind of wondering, are we gonna come back, is it gonna do this again someday and then we'll, we'll see uh, another such prolific repeater? Or is this something that um, uh, was kind of a unique experience? Uh, so the large sample of bursts in recent years means that we can look at the shapes of the bursts. So again, these are waterfall plots with time and frequency and the colors, the, the brightness. And we see uh, a bunch of different uh, shapes of things. So uh, repeating bursts tend to show, uh, they tend to be narrower in frequency, so a little more, a little more like this or, or this. And uh, sometimes they'll show this downward drifting structure which has been called the, the sad trombone uh, structure because the, if you were to play it as audio, it sounds a bit like, um, well, let's see if it gets to work. No. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, that's what we expect, or that's what we see. Uh, but we also see sometimes there are uh, substructures on microsecond scales, which uh, when you get into just arguments about the this light travel time, that kind of rules out uh, things like the shock models where you need material to travel over, uh, over thousands of, of kilometers to, uh, from the central engine. Uh, uh, yeah, and so this figure on the bottom here, uh, also from this, this paper, uh, just shows within the, the Chime catalog there are uh, the one-off events showing a, a range are tended to be broader in frequency and narrower in time, and the repeaters tend to be narrower in frequency and broader in time. Uh, another uh, significant property worth mentioning is that uh, many FRBs show evidence of scattering by a, a turbulent plasma in their vicinity. Uh, so when light from a, a source propagates outward, uh, it gets scattered off of a turbulent medium so light from different paths will make its way toward the observer. And uh, by, since it's moving on different paths, it gets delayed. And the amount it gets bent, uh, it gets 
bent more at lower frequencies. So uh, going through the, the math of uh, what turbulence spectra look like, you end up with a, a frequency to the minus four power of the, uh, uh, of the, the, the width that comes out of this. And uh, so a, a paper by uh, Pragyachala last year argued that the, the observed scattering is inconsistent with um, known models of the interstellar medium, so the, the Milky Way, so it's most likely coming from the vicinity of the, of the uh, uh, FRB host, and, uh, or it could be coming from the, the circumgalactic medium, uh, the host. And so far, only uh, so many FRBs have been localized to host galaxies, uh, but there's been a lot of work in examining the properties of those host galaxies. Uh, and when they're really close, we can actually see where within the galaxy they fall, which yields some interesting information. So just comparing uh, some the host galaxies of several localized events to uh, with stellar mass of the galaxy and the star formation rate here. Uh, so you have star forming galaxies up here and then quiescent galaxies down here. Most of them, most of the observed events fall just below the, the main sequence of, uh, of star forming galaxies. Uh, and when they are observed within galaxies, they tend to be found in regions of star formation. Like we can spot uh, it's in the galactic disk, it's, uh, it's in an area with, uh, with H alpha emission. So it's uh, and they're also often found to be offset from the centers of galaxies, which implies uh, it's probably not an active galactic nucleus or like a supermassive black hole progenitor model. Uh, however, despite this trend, you do get some oddball examples. So the first repeater that was ever discovered uh, was actually found to be in a, a metal-poor massive dwarf galaxy. And, the, uh, and this FRB uh, on the right that's actually a, a globular cluster uh, off on the side of M81. And globular clusters tend to be full of old stars so, and not a lot of active star formation. So that's, that was uh, puzzling. And then with, um, with uh, really high resolution, so this image uh, from I believe Hubble shows a host galaxy and then zooming in on its source, there's a, a distinct, I can't really see it, but it, a, uh, green dot here, that's where the, the FRB is sourced, is located, and then it's offset from the nearest clump of star forming activity. So it's uh, at least inconsistent with the, uh, the idea that it's coming from, from star formation. Uh, so just putting all these points together in a single page, and having left out a few other unknowns, uh, there are uh, I won't read through all this right now, but this is, uh, there's a clear need that we need uh, for more FRB discoveries, and we also need to know where they're coming from. Identify their host galaxies, identify where they are in the host galaxies. Uh, so, how do we do this? Um, at low frequencies, it's really hard. Uh, generally, the lower the frequency of your instrument, the poorer the resolution. So. Uh, getting a high resolution image is, is difficult to do. Uh, galaxies are typically on the scale of an arc second, so anyone familiar, that's a, a 60th of a 60th of a degree. Uh, so, and certainly identifying regions within galaxies requires fractions of that. So we, uh, uh, so I've, I've two images, so there are a couple of uh, FRB experiments that are capable of doing this in real time. Uh, the main way they, they're able to do this is that they operate at higher frequencies, uh, which means that they have a smaller field of view. So the, the telescope field of view depends on the wavelength you're observing, the size of your, your dish. And so to get a, a sensitive, uh, sensitive enough to make a detection, you need a larger dish that, can, that uh, has a narrower field of view. And uh, so uh, at these high frequencies, the, the uh, resolution is higher, uh, but the field of view is narrow. So they, they detect fewer of them, but are able to identify the host galaxies. So uh, as an example, the famous repeater, uh, these circles show the localization regions of the Arecibo telescope, rest in peace, uh, and the very large array. And then on the right here, uh, I have the localization region of CHIME uh, at its best. 
and then a handful of galaxies that could be the source. Now, it's, it's tempting to just pick this one because it's most obvious there, but really there's no reason it couldn't be any of these other ones. Uh, so that's something to uh, detangle. And then to reach the millisecond uh, precision, you need to use very long baseline interferometry. So this technique takes uh, uh, radio antennas that are spread across continents, and in the process, they end up with very high resolution. So like the Event Horizon Telescope was able to get micro arc second to image a black hole. Uh, so the, uh, a big instrument working on this is the European VLBI network, or EVN. It's a project called Precise which is set to monitor active repeating sources and uh, do localization on them. So the figure over here shows uh, the localization of uh, 2020 11 where we have localization from uh, giant meter wave radio telescope, Australian SKA precursor, the VLA, and then this image is made from EVN. So that little dot in the middle there is the uh, localization region for EVN. So it's a vast improvement. Uh, however, because VLBI telescopes need to be constantly monitoring these sites in order to uh, get lucky and p pick up an events, uh, they are pretty much limited to repeating FRBs. So this is ultimately where the CHIME FRB outrigger program is going to come into this, is it's trying to combine the discovery speed of a wide field instrument with the resolution of VLBI. So that's what I'll... I'll say uh, more about uh, just next. Uh, uh, so uh, this image here, uh, which I just included because uh, I think it's uh, interesting and, and telling, it's a map of the Milky Way galaxy at uh, 600 megahertz, which is center of the Chime observing band. And then on top of it, I plotted dots for all of the FRBs that have been confirmed and the, the candidates that were te detected as of uh, June this year. And the color gives the, uh, the DM. So we're, we're getting to a point where we're really covering the sky well. And uh, I think that's pretty exciting. Uh, oh. oh, yes. I don't remember exactly. The, the galactic plane you can see through, through here. Um, yeah, there should be a equatorial plot uh, center or the nor north celestial pole right here. And yeah, you can actually see that we do exclude candidates from the galactic plane because they're more likely to be uh, pulsars. And yes? Uh, so if we can localize it to a single galaxy, so don't have seven possible hosts in, a, in, the, in the region, then that's taken to be a, a confident detection of the, the host galaxy. But we can also do a chance coincidence probability calculation to spot if um, uh, what's likely to be, uh, if it's likely to be confused with something else. Uh, Okay, so CHIME was originally built as a, a 21 centimeter intensity mapper. So it was designed to look for hyd neutral hydrogen emission from galaxies between redshifts of 0.8 and 2.5. Uh, it's made up of, it's probably one of the, the strangest shaped telescopes in the world. Uh, but it's, it's made up of these four uh, half pipe cylinders. And uh, that just acts as a reflector. And then along this, this focal line here, there is a set of um, these cloverleaf uh, petal boards, which act as the uh, uh, dual polarization uh, receiving elements. Uh, so with this weird shape, it has a, a field of view that's 120 degrees north to south and about 1.5 degrees east to west. So it's like a big, uh, I like to call it a cigar shape. Um, and with uh, combining all of the information into one, it's capable of about one arc minute of resolution. Uh, to say more about how it discovers, uh, detects FRBs, I need to say a little bit about uh, beamforming. 
So the idea with, with beamforming is you take a bunch of antennas in, uh, in an array and combine them to act as one. And in doing so, you can actually point the array without actually moving it. So uh, suppose I have an array of uh, four antennas, which are represented by these maroon diamonds. And uh, they're evenly spaced by some distance d. And I want to look at a source of radio emission coming from an angle theta from the, uh, the vertical, which here is horizontal because that's how it fit on the slide. Uh, then a wavefront from that source will hit the antennas at different times. So the, the voltage versus time that each records will be shifted. So this one got it earlier, this one got it later, and later and later. Uh, if I just add those together as they are, well, for a source that's directly overhead, that'll add up coherently, but for, for a source off to the side, it won't. But if I then apply a, a shift in time, I can align the pulses sum them together, and get a strong signal. So that's how it ends up being sensitive to a particular direction. You choose which delays you want to add, and that's, you, can, uh, you can steer it. And with a regularly spaced instrument like this, uh, because the delays, we're, we're dealing with um, uh, Fourier transform data, the shift in time ends up being a rotation in, in phase. Uh, end result is that we end up with uh, an operation that's just a discrete Fourier transform. So uh, with a discrete Fourier transform, we can apply the fast Fourier transform algorithm, which lets us do this operation to form uh, 256 beams in the north-south direction really fast. Uh, on top of that, there's another the Fourier transform in the east-west direction. So we end up with 1,024 beams in total. So each beam, then, is a, a stream of complex, vo uh, complex voltages that have been broken up into frequency channels. Uh, at a one millisecond resolution. Well, higher resolution than that, but it, it gets changed a bit. And this is all done on uh, gra graphics processing units. And, and apologies for the, again, another uh, dense looking figure, but the main thing I want to show here is that we start with these beams in uh, a fa stage called L0. Uh, then on these GPUs, uh, we perform a very fast dispersion algorithm. So this takes the, the time streams and uh, or for each beam, it will transform it into a, a bunch of different uh, possible DMs. So we're looking for dispersed pulses, that's what we need to do. Uh, and then for each DM, it will look for calculate an SNR. All the while, it's storing this, uh, these, this beam data in a, a buffer, so it's hold, held there for, for about 30 seconds. If a candidate is picked up, it gets sent along to the next stage, which looks for similar events among multiple beams. Then ultimately, that gets sent out to another system, which will uh, check to uh, do a variety of check quality control checks to make sure it's it's still a good pulse. And if all of that checks out, it'll send a, a signal back to this to L1 to save the buffers down to the disk. So with that, then we have this intensity recording data for for uh, for these pulses, and. Uh, so yeah, that, uh, and that, all that with a latency of about 23 seconds. So we're, it's really fast at, uh, at getting these candidates and, uh, and writing them to disk. Uh, the limitation of this, though, is that we, I can just go back uh, quickly. Uh, if we local, uh, identify pulses this way, we can only tell if it's in, which beam it's in, which means that that's the, the size of each of these dots is about how precisely we can localize the pulse. So to improve on this, another uh, buffer was later added that stores those raw channelized voltages before the beam forming step. So that's a lot of data at once, but it's kept for 40 seconds worth of data. And if it's a really uh, likely to be real event, another tr trigger gets sent back that dumps that to disk. And so with that baseband data, we, we, the, the intensity data from the beam, with the beam form data we uh, lose a lot of information along the way but with the baseband's, just raw channelized voltages. Uh, we have all the information. We can rephase things. We can uh, change our time and, and frequency resolution. So as an example of this, uh, this is what uh, wa some waterfall, pop, wa waterfall pop looked like in the intensity data. And this is what it looks like with baseband. And, with, and further, with the baseband data, we can do more uh, beam forming tests, uh, so form 
look at a, a form beams around a, a given location and ultimately get a resolution. Uh, this is the, the 20, uh, 20, or sorry, the um, one arc, arc minute resolution achievable with the telescope as opposed to a quarter degree uh, resolution that's achievable with the, with the beams alone. So an arc minute's good, but it's not an arc seconds, which is what we need for galaxy identification. So for that, uh, we need more telescopes. Uh, so in this it's a really nice picture that was taken of the uh, Green Bank Observatory Outrigger Telescope, uh, which I'll say more about in a minute. Uh, are there any other questions before we move on? No? No? OK. Uh, so the plan is to build three of these uh, outrigger telescopes. And uh, so these photos show the, uh, well, a recent build stage of each site. Uh, in uh, Princeton, the town of Princeton, British Columbia, which is about 65 kilometers from Chime, uh, is the first telescope. And that's uh, been built, all the digital hardware has been installed, and we're getting data from that. Uh, Green Bank, West Virginia, I haven't updated this, fo this photo because I couldn't find one that fit neatly in the spot, but uh, this is what it, essentially how it started. And uh, that has now been built and is awaiting hardware or digital hardware installation. And the last site in uh, Hat Creek, California, has yet to break ground, but we're still negotiating uh, contracts with builders to make the foundation. And the hope is that all three of these will be operating and collecting data and doing localization by this time, by, well, next year. Certainly by this time next year. And just to get a, another nice photo of, of Green Bank, uh, this one was taken. They put uh, Canadian and American flags over it because it is an international venture. As you may have noticed, these uh, certainly it's obvious with Green Bank, the, the dishes are, are rolled because they have to point at the same part of the sky as Chime. And so it's sufficiently off for that. So uh, how is this going to work? Well, the outrigger system is pretty much just an extension of the baseband readout system, uh, except we're adding a, a, another beam that can track uh, calibrator sources. So over here I have uh, at Chime, there's a, the intensity buffer, or sorry, the baseband buffer, and the intensity candidate search. And uh, at each site, there's the baseband buffer and also a buffer of uh, gated pulsar tracking data. And on a candidate detection, then a signal will be sent out from uh, over the internet to tell the outrigger to dump its baseband data and its tracking beam data. The baseband data is then beam formed to the fiducial site of the, uh, of the source, so a nice data reduction step. And then at a, another computing site, uh, it will be cross correlated to do the localization. And the localization essentially amounts to we're treating Chime and each outrigger as a phased array pointed at the source and measuring the time, uh, the difference in time from when the pulse reaches Chime and when it reaches each outrigger. And by in doing that, we're measuring the angle of the source direction from the baseline. And that actually gets us with enough uh, timing precision that gets us to the uh, to milli arc second resolution on these long baselines. So effectively, it's a really precise timing measurement. Uh, each instrument is getting a, a phase of the data uh, versus time. So the time stamped on each uh, data, data point is a sum of several components. So we have uh, the geometric component that this depends on the, the difference in the, what we want to measure. That's the difference in arrival time at each site. Then there is a uh, further delay due to differences in the thickness of the ionosphere, so the upper atmosphere, a layer of, uh, of plasma. And that's turbulent. It's got structures in it. It's real nasty. Uh, the troposphere is also, the, the wet troposphere is also important for VLBI generally, but it, at our, in our band, it's uh, less significant. And then uh, the instruments themselves aren't perfect. There's an additional delay from that. And then clocking errors can also throw things off, because each site has its own clock. So we have to get rid of all of these uh, confounding factors and figure out uh, what we're doing, or what, what the geometric delay is. So just to summarize it again, uh, we have complex voltages at each site. 
that depends on the total time and the frequency. Cross-correlating just amounts to multiplying them, to get, uh, conjugating, multiplying them, and then we're left with a total delay that's made up of the difference in the uh, arrival times, the uh, difference in the ionosphere contributions, the difference in the instrumental contributions, and a, a clock error. So the clock, uh, I won't say too much about. We need to get, or it's believed that with the, uh, we have very precise frequency standards at each site. There's a, a rubidium oscillator that's going to the Princeton site and Hat Creek, and then a chime, and at uh, Green Bank there are, are masers. And uh, with these, so this is a measure called the um, uh, Allen variance. Uh, look at how the uncertainty in the time shift or changes over, over distance and uh, or, or over time. And uh, with these, we can recalibrate the clocks to very high precision. Uh, so our specifications, we, we're going to get this to within 200 picoseconds of precision. Uh, for the instrumental errors, uh, we use a process called phase referencing. So this is the reason for the, uh, the tracking beams on the pulsars is that we have a, a calibrator source of no, very precisely known position, and then our, our, uh, our uh, FRB source, which we're trying to identify. And the instrumental errors are not uh, dependent on the, on the, uh, the position of, of either source. So we divide these two, those cancel out, and we're just left with the geometric delay, which is now relative to the pulsar, and the ionospheric delay. Uh, so for this, why are we using pulsars? Um, most VLBI experiments have these strong, well-defined calibration targets. Uh, unfortunately, many of them are, um, well, there just aren't enough of them. Uh, Chime is observing a very narrow stripe of the sky uh, throughout the day, and we don't know when an FRB is going to go off. So we need a calibrator at all times. And so this plot's showing uh, for, for, for right ascension, essentially time of day, uh, where are the pulsars that we can use? And uh, the gray boxes show like how long they're in the time field of view. And so there's a, a project going with, right now with um, uh, Jane Katzmarek and Alice Curtin uh, from uh, DRAO and, um, and McGill uh, to use the very long baseline array, uh, a VLBA experiment in the US, to uh, ob observe a population of pulsars and more precisely localize them. And this is also going to be useful for, uh, for some pulsar experiments that Chime is going to be doing. Uh, and so the last thing to deal with is the ionosphere, which is the, uh, the most challenging. But uh, for this, we can use uh, their separate agencies that measure the ionosphere using GPS satellites and things. That gives us a nice uh, uh, prior on it. But to actually uh, get rid of it entirely, we, we take advantage of the wide band paths of Chime. We have 400 megahertz to work with. And uh, much like, since it's a layer of plasma, the ionosphere has a dispersive effect on the, the pulse data. So in the end, we, the, um, the effect of it is the total delay from the ionosphere is equivalent. It has a, a 1 over frequency squared dependence. So we can jointly fit for parts of the, the phase of the, the visibility or the, the cross-correlation data that go as, as frequency, linearly with frequency or inversely with frequency. And uh, so using this, this is uh, an example from a paper by Tomas Casanelli where he looked at a crab pulse and uh, a chime and a, uh, a telescope and at the Algonquin Radio Observatory, which are uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of kilometers apart, and was able to, to uh, separate these components. Uh, so a lot of this was uh, demonstrated with these Pathfinder experiments. So we have on the site of Chime, before Chime was built, there was the Pathfinder, which is just these two dishes. Uh, and then I mentioned the Algonquin Radio Observatory. There's a, a 10 meter dish there. And then another uh, interferometer in Green Bank called TONE, which is confusingly not an acronym for anything. Uh, but using these, uh, the team was able to test out the triggering and uh, cross-correlation data or methods. And um, well, they got really lucky. So last year, on June 6th, there was a really bright burst. So this is showing uh, in the middle column is, is this burst. Really bright burst detected a chime. 
and they happen to collect the baseband data from ARO and Tone at the same time. Fortunately, it doesn't show up in, in these plots. But shortly after and before, they also collected uh, data from a crab giant pulse. And so they're able to use those, because we don't have the tracking beam, the pulsar stuff yet, but we were able to use these to phase reference uh, the FRB and ultimately achieve a very high uh, localization. So to this, this galaxy, this is uh, on, so this is like arc minute scale here, and here's the localization contour uh, from, from this project. Uh, since they produced this plot, there has been some debate over this that you might have made a slight error. It's more, it may be more like this now, but uh, this was a, an important demonstration that this method of, of using a few baselines to localize an event in real time like this, uh, and this is a one-off first, uh, is possible. And uh, right, so with the last 10 minutes, I'll say a little bit about the progress we've made so far in uh, commissioning these, uh, these new telescopes. Um, are there any questions right now? OK. Uh, all right, so last uh, March, uh, I was sent out with uh, some of my colleagues from McGill to go install the digital hardware at uh, the Princeton site. So uh, this is what a lot of it looks like, or this is what it looks like. Or, uh, so we have so-called X-Engine nodes that do all of the, uh, uh, these are the hosting the GPUs that do all of the uh, cross-correlation stuff with the, within the feeds. Uh, compute nodes that are running a lot of our uh, search algorithms and uh, tracking beams. Uh, we'll be running the tracking beams. And then the uh, Fourier transforms are done with this, uh, these so-called ice boards, which run uh, FPGAs and uh, feeds from fiber optic cables between the two. Funny thing about this, uh, so these, these ice boards are meant to fit in this ice crate, but uh, we are only using half of it. Uh, and there were cooling issues because there's a, a fan under here that blows cold air up. So we, the ones on the outside were, were heating up too much. So we ended up getting this um, piece of this apartment for rent sign from a local hardware store and cutting it and jamming it in there. And that seemed to, to mostly fix it. Uh, shortly after we installed the digital hardware, uh, things got warm enough that the uh, teams from uh, UBC and DRIO were able to go to the site and install all of the cables, of which there are many, and the, uh, these so-called cassettes, which are little fiberglass boxes that each contain two of the, uh, the feeds. And uh, yes, yeah, so that's Khalud, Kerry, and uh, Matthias uh, Lasda, who's an undergrad at McGill, uh, in a, a system for scanning the uh, uh, barcodes on each part, so there's a, a big database of uh, how every part is connected to every other. Uh, so shortly after that was installed, we then got first light. Uh, so this plot is showing uh, from June 27th, we had, uh, this is uh, for a single feed and multiple frequencies, the uh, transits of several bright sources. And uh, this is the, what the waterfall pl plot looks like for a full day. So very obvious, we can see when the sun crosses overhead, and also when uh, Cygnus A, which is another bright source, crosses overhead. So this is very encouraging. However, uh, things are got, have gotten a little worse at the site. So uh, the, the Princeton site is not actually a protected radio quiet zone like Green Bank or DRAO. Uh, it, is an active, it's actually near a lot of copper mining. And uh, there was, they actually installed in the time between scouting the site and building the stuff, uh, they installed a new uh, cell phone tower just across the, the valley from it. So ironically, the Airbnb I was staying at at the site had no cell phone reception, but the radio telescope we were building, I could talk to my cell phone just fine. So that's a little discouraging, but we're, we're hopeful they're, we're installing, um, and they should, arriving soon, uh, notch filters that will knock on the cell phone contamination and uh, whatever that is. Uh, so with the data we have so far, we've been able to do some, some very rough uh, calibration and uh, noise estimates. So with this, I've taken uh, a, the 
data from a single uh, input and plot it over time around the transit of Cygnus A. So this peak over here is the source transit. And I believe this uh, rising power here is because there's um, uh, a bright clump of the, the Milky Way galaxy that, that uh, shortly follows it. Um, but with that, I, I just took the height of the peak over a linear fit to the base within the transit window. That's how long it's in the beam. And that told me, all right, this is the, in the uncalibrated units of the correlator, this is uh, how, how bright it is at that frequency. And with that, scale to the actual brightness of Cygnus A and do rough calibration. And so this is showing so-called so uh, system equivalent no flux density, which is a measure of the, the system noise, by applying this calibration to data taken an hour before. And I uh, took the same uh, transit data from Chime, and this is just a comparison of the two. And we're seeing it's very noisy because the calibration is not great, but uh, it is in roughly the right uh, noise range for, for our hardware. So that is encouraging to see. In terms of uh, cross-correlation, uh, so these are showing uh, inputs. So there are 128 at, uh, at the PCO site. And uh, input versus input. The value here is the, the phase of the, the correlation between them. And because of the way the, uh, the feeds are separated, there's this uh, wave fringing pattern that comes outward. Uh, I should also mention that it's really 64, blocks of 64, uh, because each polarization doesn't cross correlate with the other. So we see it's mostly noise in this region and, uh, and a good cross correlation here. And uh, these black bands are coming from feeds that just haven't been plugged in yet. Uh, but by taking the assumed positions of the, the feeds and applying that, uh, the, the phases that we would apply for beam forming, we're able to remove this phase is a process called fringe stopping. So that shows that we're, we're getting good cross correlations and are able to, to work with it. And much more recently, uh, uh, Juan, who is now a professor at Toronto, uh, took this uh, initial data set that we've been getting after we've fixed a whole bunch of other bugs that have come up and made what, what uh, we call a ring map, where which is, uh, for each time, beam forms to a range of uh, declinations. And that gives us a, a picture of the sky sort of unwrapped. And the, this doesn't take into account any of the other weird instrumental effects that, that come up. But we do see uh, the sun and then reflections of the sun off the dish that will push it to, to other declinations in the image. And then there's the Milky Way plane. There's Cygnus A, something called the Cygnus X complex, the star forming region, and Cassiopeia A. And this is just for one frequency, uh, so a, a relatively good one, but uh, progress is underway. So uh, all that said, I think uh, I can summarize by just saying that Chime FRB is currently the leading instrument in detecting FRBs, but it lacks the resolution required to identify their host galaxies, which is something we'd really like to do. Uh, so adding these outrigger telescopes will enable VLBI capabilities uh, to Chime and uh, let us rapidly identify these host galaxies. And with these data, we can greatly enhance the usefulness of FRBs as cosmological probes and uh, improve our understanding of their origins. So uh, the next couple of years, you can expect of order a 1,000 localized FRBs, which is going to, to make a big difference. So thank you all. <laughs>